Hello, my lovelies. Welcome back to the Geek Suite. I'm your host, the one and only Kidner Bean, and today we're in my kitchen because I'm on fire evac watch and I don't have the time to properly set up my studio. But don't worry, I will most likely be okay. I'm far enough away from the fires in California right now that it shouldn't be a problem, but I am keeping an eye on things. Alright, my lovelies, today's video we are going to be continuing our Game of Thrones D&D 5e series, Dungeons and Dragons and Ice and Fire. In this series, we compare Game of Thrones characters to their book counterparts using the Dungeons and Dragons 5e character sheets. And for all of our new viewers, be sure to hit like and subscribe and ring that notification bell so you can stay up to date on all of our latest content. For today's episode, we're going with the Patreon and Twitter poll winner for our next character, and you all have chosen Sansa Stark. I was kind of hoping to have a couple more of these under my belt before getting to someone like Sansa or Cersei, as they don't exactly fit into these traditional classes for D&D, but hey, we're gonna go for it. And as per usual, we're gonna go ahead and insert a all-encompassing spoiler warning for both the books and the show, including but not limited to bonus feature content and pre-release chapters for the Winds of Winter. So if you are, you know, incomplete in your delve into the world of Ice and Fire, Please be warned that we may be spoiling some things for you in this episode. Okay, so as I've stated, today's character is going to be the lovely but sad Sansa Stark. And, as I've stated, Sansa is a more difficult character to do one of these sheets for, as she doesn't really have a hard um, class description that would fit her well, at least the way she's presented in the show. But for her book character, it's going to be a little bit easier, so that's where we're going to start this analysis. In the books, Sansa's human so there's really no difficulty figuring out this part. There are some theories that the Starks are mixed with the blood of the Children of the Forest, and that's where they get their warging abilities, and I'll link a great video to those theories in the description down below. But for now, we're just going to stick with human, as any magic she would have would not be out of the norm in D&D for a human character. For her class, in the books I'm going to classify her as a bard. Looking at the description of bard in D&D, we see the following. In the worlds of D&D, words and music are not just vibrations of air, but vocalizations with power all their own. The bard is a master of song, speech, and the magic they contain. Bards say that the multiverse was spoken into existence, that the words of the gods gave it shape, and that echoes of these primordial words of creation still resound throughout the cosmos. The music of the bards is an attempt to snatch and harness those echoes, subtly woven into their spells and powers. Looking at Sansa and her character arc, we see from the beginning the importance of song for her. In A Game of Thrones, her head is filled with songs and stories told to her by her parents and her handmaids and her septa. She's thrilled to move to the capital and have her life become a real life song. However, on her journey and once she arrives, as and throughout the progression of her story, she learns rather quickly and rather harshly that life is not a song, sweetling. However, we see that her nature as a bard and her trust in the power of songs and prayer perseveres and is a point of power for her. This is particularly evident in her King's Landing story arc and with her encounters with Sandra Clegane, aka the Hound. We see that even after the bread riots, she enjoys going to church and sings with the others as a prayer for the hungry. During the Battle of the Blackwater, she leads the women in song to keep their spirits up as they hide in Mager's Holdfast. And perhaps most notably within her story arc when looking at evidence for bard-like powers, is her encounter with the Hound at the Blackwater. Towards the end of the Battle of the Blackwater, Sander Clegane, whose courage had broken during the fighting, finds his way to Sansa Stark's bedroom. He lies down on her bed and falls asleep waiting for her. Sansa eventually arrives. The Hound is very drunk and drunker than she'd ever seen him. He offers to take Sansa with him as he intends to flee the city. He mentions going north somewhere. She does not understand what he means. He pushes her on the bed, holds a dagger to her throat, and drunkenly demands that she sing him the song that she had promised him earlier. Sansa is too terrified to remember the words of the song of Florian and Jonquil, but instead she sings the mother's hymn. Gentle mother, font of mercy, save our sons from war we pray. Stay the swords and stay the arrows, let them know a better day. Gentle mother, strength of women, help our daughters through this fray. Soothe the wrath and tame the fury, teach 
teach us all a kinder way. The hound falls silent and removes the dagger from her throat, and Sansa gently touches his cheek, feeling a wetness that was blood and a wetness that was not blood. Tears. Shortly thereafter, he gets up, rips off his bloody white cloak, and leaves. Sansa shakes out the torn and bloody cloak and huddles beneath it, shivering. Sir Dantos eventually comes to tell her that the battle is won and the city is saved. We also see some evidence of her bard-like skills coming into play in the Vale with Robin Aaron. She doesn't sing to him explicitly, and as far as we know, she can't play any musical instruments, but he is adamant about her telling him stories. This is important to note because stories, especially in Martin's world, were often told through song, as this was common in the Middle Ages as literacy was rare. Robin Aaron, aka Sweet Robin, becomes enamored with Sansa slash Elaine and insists on spending as much time with her as possible and even becoming possessive and irate as the notion of her being married off to anyone other than him looms over the horizon. And this is likely the subconscious work of Sansa's bard powers on Sweet Robin. She's excited about the notion of marrying handsome Harry the heir, but she is cautious, considering her last few engagements, and is weary of Littlefinger's intentions. She can't stand her cousin Sweet Robin, but she at least knows that he can't or won't hurt her, and she can more or less control him. While she may, somewhere in her heart, want another chance at the handsome boy from the songs and a happily ever after, deep down she knows she's better off where she is. So we've established that Sansa is a human bard using her powers to manipulate the people around her, and now we're going to go ahead and look at her background. And, much like we did for Daenerys, her background's going to be kind of obvious. She was born and raised and treated, for the most part, as a lady slash princess of Westeros. Albeit, when we leave her at the end of A Dance with Dragons the, and the few released chapters of The Winds of Winter, she's living as a bastard, but she's still considered a lady. They often call her Lady Elaine in the Vale. And, just like I felt with Daenerys, I can't really think of a better background for her than that of the noble. Uh, but she is living in exile, so there may be a better background out there. If anyone who's more experienced in D&D wants to go ahead and give me a shout out in the comment section down below, if there's anything better, go ahead and let me know. I'd really appreciate it. And as far as alignment goes, Sansa is lawful good, like much of the Starks at the beginning of A Game of Thrones. And this really makes sense. She's believed in honor and that good triumphs and all the other BS that her family raised her with in Winterfell. This later comes back to bite her and several other members of the Stark and Tully families as the story progresses. Now, Sansa may begin to slip a little closer to lawful neutral the more time she spends around Cersei and Littlefinger, as we can see with her inner monologue during her time in the Vale. She knows that Littlefinger is shady, but she chooses to align with him in his decisions, even though they may go against her better judgment. Now, looking at the information we've got so far, as a human bard who is lawful good and has a noble background, we're going to select the following skills for her. Acrobatics, and I know this one seems a little out of nowhere for people who have watched the show and read the books, but she is a remarkable dancer and can scale down the mountain face without injury after the purple wedding and is good on horseback, etc, etc. We're also going to select perception, as she quickly learns to read people and has had to make life or death decisions several times a day as a Lannister hostage. Insight, as she is a frickin' savant about houses and sigils and loyalties and all the political hoopla that goes along with that, and she's able to rapidly adjust to the volatile life at court. And we also have persuasion. Sansa's beauty and charm carry her quite a long way through her story, as she is able to survive and get out of King's Landing in a time when nobody should want to be within 50 yards of her. Alright, so now that we've covered the basics and established her skills, let's go ahead and see how her character abilities break down. And just a reminder, we're going to be doing a sort of blending of using the D&D metrics to see where these various skills and abilities level out for Sanda, Sansa, comparing them against information we get from the book series. And again, normally when setting up a D&D character, uh, average for any given ability is usually about a 10 with 14 to 16 being on the high end, and 18 and up being reserved for supernaturally powerful beings. Sansa, as a warg, exhibits some of these powers and may end up at one of these supernatural levels as a result when we go through our analysis. So for her strength, we're going to go ahead and put that in at a 10. We don't see any evidence that she's physically weak or weaker than the average person, but unlike Danny, who's petite, Sansa is rather tall. In the books, her height is repeatedly noted, especially in scenes with the Hound, where he doesn't tower over her in the same way that he does most others, and that she is taller than Littlefinger. 
We also see that in the book, she takes a fair amount of abuse with regards to repeated beatings from the Kingsguard at Joffrey's command. Okay, and moving on to the next category, we have dexterity. Her mother notes that Sansa was a lady at three. And we see in her characterization that Sansa is beautiful and graceful. She's noted to be a marvelous dancer and is careful and cautious with her action and words. So, looking at that, we're going to give her a 12, higher than the average commoner. Moving on to constitution, she is going to be average here. We noted that her strength is average for her world, and even though she is taller than most girls her age. We see her taking numerous beatings at Joffrey's command, and she is affected by them in a manner that we would expect someone of her build to see. She hides her pain and her emotions behind a mask of courtesy, but she is affected nonetheless. So, for constitution, she gets an average 10. Okie dokie, let's move on to intelligence and wisdom. We see as her arc progresses that she grows and learns from her experiences. Maybe not as fast as she should, despite the Hound's frequent warnings and him covering for her, but as a Stark... I'm a slow learner. It's true. But I learn. Give me She's not a master schemer like Tyrion or Tywin or Littlefinger, but by the end of A Dance with Dragons and the pre-release Sansa chapters of The Winds of Winter, we do see that she's learning to scheme and spy from Littlefinger. She's still a considerable few steps behind her peers when it comes to the game, but she is moving from piece to player. So let's give Book Sansa an 11. Talking about learning from experience and listening to Littlefinger, let's move on to wisdom. She's wise enough to know that she has a lot to learn, and is wise enough to know that she can learn from Littlefinger, but shouldn't trust him. Which is a big deal in the books, because unlike in the TV show where Littlefinger's almost like this cartoonish villain that everyone knows should be untrustworthy, he's actually very good at hiding this and ingratiates himself to all of the highborn characters who then trust him and fall victim to his schemes. Whereas Sansa, as an insider living as Elaine in the Vale, realizes what it is he's up to and has a unique perspective on Littlefinger's actions and motives. So that's above average for anyone else in the series, but given that she has this unique insight, it doesn't make her overly perceptive or overly wise. So she's pretty average and considering that she's only like 13 when we last see her, we're gonna go ahead and just leave it at a 10. Alrighty, so we're down to our last major section, charisma. And Sansa has a supernaturally high level of charisma in the books, even more so than Daenerys. Yes, she's beautiful, and yes, she has a classic lady's charm and grace, but not so much so as to get the kind of help that she does, and definitely not from the people she does. Let's look at who helps her first, the Hound. This is a man who has been burned, sorry, from, by society. He's essentially given up on life and relegated to living his role of monstrous Clegane that the world has assigned to him based on his brother's reputation. He's a miserable mean drunk with a penchant for violence and is really only interested in self-preservation. He has no reason to take any interest or help Sansa, yet he does. He becomes almost obsessed. He repeatedly inserts himself into her routine lies for her to Joffrey at the tournament and other instances throughout their time in King's Landing together, and he covers for her when she sneaks off to the Godswood to meet with Dantos to plot her escape. Now, he doesn't know that's what she's doing, but it doesn't really matter what she's doing because the result would be the same had anyone like Joffrey or Cersei found out. He also gives her advice on how to best survive in King's Landing as Joffrey's plaything, and even risks his own life to speak out against the king publicly in court during one of Sansa's beatings. He gets nothing from this, and more than once risks his losing his livelihood and potentially his life for her. Why? Why does he feel drawn to her? And more importantly, he's not the only one. Almost immediately upon arrival in King's Landing, Sansa is clocked by Littlefinger, and we see this inter reaction between her and Littlefinger at the King's Hands tournament. When Sansa finally looked up, a man was standing over her, staring. He was short, with a pointed beard and a silver streak in his hair, almost as old as her father. You must be one of the daughters, he said to her. He had grey-green eyes that did not smile when his mouth did. You have the Tully look. I'm Sansa Stark, she said, ill at ease. The man wore a heavy cloak with a fur collar. 
fastened with a silver mockingbird, and he had the effortless manner of a high lord, but she did not know him. I have not had the honor, my lord. Septimor Dane quickly took a hand. Sweet child, this is Lord Peter Baelish of the King's Small Council. Your mother was my queen of beauty once, the man said quietly. His breath smelled of mint. You have her hair. His fingers brushed against her cheek as he stroked one auburn lock. Quite abruptly, he turned and walked away. Okay, and I mean, I almost want to give Sansa a couple more perception points for this because she's the only person who, immediately upon meeting Littlefinger, does whatever the medieval lady equivalent of I need an adult is. She's immediately put at unease by him, whereas everyone else thinks that he's just some hapless, wannabe, up-jumped lord. In addition to this super creepy introduction, we also see Littlefinger make several not so solely self-serving moves to help Sansa during her stay in King's Landing. His plot to remove her and hide her in the Vale does for the most part seem to really only be of benefit to him, but he does give her advice and reminds her that life is not a song and to be a better liar if she's to survive life at court. He doesn't need to do these things to get her out of King's Landing, but he wants to endear himself to her. Yes, he does endear himself to everyone so they will give him favors, but the motivations between endearing himself to members of the High Court in King's Landing and to Sansa seem to be very, very different. Yes, there are theories that he's got like an obsession, sexual, magical, or some other origin with the Tully looks, but it appears to be more than that with her. Catelyn and Lysa were disposable eventually to Littlefinger, and this doesn't appear to be so with Sansa. We also see Sansa's charm endear many people to her throughout the story, most of them being men. And while she is described as beautiful and she repeatedly fantasizes about her life as being a song, it is important to remember that she is 11 to 13 years old, depending on where you are in the series. She is a literal child. These are grown ass men falling head over heels, head over heels, and doing favors, sometimes life threatening ones in the cases of Dantos, Littlefinger, and Clegane, for a child. And not just a child, but a royal hostage. An enemy of the state, a traitor's daughter, a prisoner of war, and a prisoner of war of the most powerful and volatile family in Westeros. These are people who are helping Sansa at the risk of crossing the King and Tywin Lannister. So she needs to have some supernaturally powered charisma in order to get the kind of love and support that she does. And let's keep in mind that while Danny also had supernaturally charged charisma, people were willing to help her because they wanted to use and utilize her dragons. Sansa doesn't have dragons, and the one supernatural animal that she did have, Lady, was killed very early on in her story, so she doesn't have any type of leverage at all other than being, you know, quote-unquote, the key to the north. But even then, some of these people who are helping her have no interest or no real shot at becoming that person to her. And it is commonly believed that she is achieving this charisma and drawing people in through her warging abilities. We see her siblings come into their powers, with the exception of Riz Rickon, who's effed off to Skagos, apparently, throughout the course of their stories. These initially start with the connection to their direwolves, and then expand from there. Bran often uses the phrase, reaching out, to describe when he leaves his body to go into his wolf summer, or to the trees later on in the story. Sansa, as I just mentioned, lost her wolf quite early on in the story and she feels this loss rather deeply immediately afterwards and when they first arrived at King's Landing. So perhaps this charming people around her who shouldn't have any reason to help her is her sort of quote unquote reaching out. And instead of slipping into the skin of an animal, she's making those around her susceptible to suggestion. Sort of like a lesser version of Br Bran warging into Hodor. She isn't outright hardcore mind controlling these people, but rather she's using her warging abilities essentially to charm them into helping her when they have every reason not to. And speaking of charisma and charming people into doing things they normally wouldn't, let me is make you susceptible to joining our Patreon family. 
Your support allows us to continue producing content like this, and our patrons get special perks like early access to our videos, access to the Geeks we Discord server, and a chance to vote in our polls like the one that selected the topic of this video. Our Patreon link is in the description section down below. Now, looking at things like armor class and initiative, they're not particularly important per se for Sansa, but we're going to go ahead and fill them in anyway. As a human with no armor, her armor class is 10, which is average, initiative is 0, and a base speed of 30. Now, for the rest of this character sheet, we're really only going to stick to the boxes that are most relevant for her character comparison. So, for instance, we'll fill in the other proficiencies and languages with things like in-depth knowledge of houses, and essentially a PhD in Westerosi poli sci. High Valyrian language, as all highborns were taught High Valyrian as a second language. Warging powers, and sewing, because it's repeatedly noted what a good seamstress she is. Okay, so for features and traits, let's look at what her powers as a bard will get her, and how those line up with her story arc. The first of which is bardic inspiration. You can inspire others through stirring words or music. To do so, you use a bonus action on your turn to choose one creature other than yourself within 60 feet of, you can, of whom can hear you. This creature gains one bardic inspiration die, a d6, yada yada yada. We see this exemplified in Megor's hold flask during the Battle of the Blackwater. We also see it with her meetings with Dantos, with Joffrey before the battle, etc. etc. The next ability is Jack of All Trades. Starting at the second level, you can add half your proficiency bonus rounded down to any ability check that doesn't already include your proficiency bonus. I mean, we can see this when she's able to do things like scale a frickin' cliff face easy peasy as a dainty high court lady when she escapes after the purple wedding. We also have Song of Rest. At second level, you can use soothing music or oration to help revitalize your wounded allies during a short rest. Again, we see this with the Hound when he comes uh, to run away, when they have their meeting after the Battle of Blackwater, and we also see examples of this when she sings to Sweet Robin or tells him stories to calm him down during his fits of rage so he doesn't have a seizure. Okay, let's look at her personality traits and see how D&D uh, breaks down these reflections of her character. So first we're going to have Easy Going. This is a friendly character. Being friendly means that people like talking to you and you have no problem making friends. However, you have a hard time standing up for yourself or getting into fights, and you may have a problem if you need to be more aggressive in your act. An easygoing character may be gullible as well. I mean, yeah, Sansa's hella gullible. She believed all the fairy tales that her parents told her growing up, and this really did a number on her when she went out into the real world. We do also see this problem with being aggressive or standing up for yourself during the little pseudo trial at the um, in at the crossroads when she and Joffrey and Arya are going over the wolf incident and this results in the loss of her wolf even though it was Arya's wolf who bit Joffrey. All right the next characteristic we're going to go with is distinctive. This is when someone has a physical trait that sets them apart. They can have big ears, a scar, or another characteristic that sets them apart. As you can imagine, this can be a bit of a disadvantage if your character is trying to hide or disguise themselves. However, it gives your character a bit of a reputation. If your character has a limp, for example, they may use it to get sympathy. And for this, uh, Sansa is going to have her tully looks, the bright red hair, blue eyes, and her excessive height, give her away instantly, so much so that she needs to dye her hair when hiding in the veil. Our next characteristic is going to be suspicious. Suspicious characters are skeptical of everyone they meet. This can help them spot people who are trying to do them wrong, but the problem with that is that it can turn people away from you because of how distrustful you are. Now, Sansa doesn't start out as a suspicious character, but she becomes more and more so after her father's death and that huge betrayal by Joffrey. Her ideals, we're going to keep this simple. Her ideals are love and beauty. She just wants her life to be like the songs. She wants to marry a high lord and who's handsome and be a rich lady in a big castle and live happily ever after. She knows that the reality of this is unlikely by the time we get to the end of A Dance with Dragons and the pre-release chapters of The Winds of Winter, but every time something in her life happens that is remotely close to something of a song, she goes right into hyperfixation mode and fantasy land. 
she can't help but think that maybe this time it'll work out. Uh, her bonds, these are going to be people that she has relationships with in the books, and so that would be for her. Um, the Hound, Littlefinger, and Lady, and I suppose her siblings, depending on where you are in her story. And of course, her biggest flaw is going to be that she, initially, is way too trusting and just kind of a dumb kid. It's not really her fault, but, you know, there's nothing she can do about it other than try to survive. Which she does a very good job of by the end of the A Dance with Dragons slash The Winds of Winter pre-release. Alrighty, well, there you have it. Here is what the George R.R. Martin version of Sansa Stark looks like spelled out on paper. Thanks for sticking around to see how our little bird turned out. Be sure to hit like and subscribe and ring that notification bell. And stay tuned for part two, where we build, or attempt to build, a character sheet for Show Sansa and see how they compare side by side. Alrighty, my lovelies, that's all the time I have for today. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time. Mwah!